Hi, welcome back to Go on the Run. And today we're going to be looking at Block Cipher. Now, we've already looked at how to encrypt text both with using a symmetric key and an asymmetric key. So, what other type of cipher could we possibly be using that now we need to introduce a block cipher? Now, before we jump into it, if you like what you're seeing, hit the thumbs up button. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe, spread the word. That helps me out a lot to get more people here. And some of you might be getting a hint from the fact that there's block in there, meaning like chunk, think of chunk data, right? And so we'll see why we need to do this. So before I get in though, um, let me first go back and take a look at one of the examples that we've had. And then I'll show you some slides. So if we, take a look at our um, project directory here and we look back, we will see that oh, in part four, we did asymmetric encryption. And so I wanna go back and revisit one of those examples. And let's go to example three. That was the last example we worked on. And so we had this key gen example that generated a key. And if you don't have this example, don't worry, just um, grab the code from GitHub and go into the key gen directory and, you know, just do go run and main, and it's going to run the code and generate um, those keys. And so we generated in that example, a private key and a public key. And the example was pretty straightforward. Um, so if I do that, we can see that all it was is use RSA to generate a new key of some key size. In this case, it was 1024 um, bits. And then we write those key out into two files at the public key and the private key. So very simple, straightforward example. Okay, so after we have the two keys now, our public key and private key, remember we're doing asymmetric encryption. And what we wanna demonstrate is that you can use one key for encryption and the other key for decryption. Specifically, we wanna demonstrate that how you can use the public key to encrypt some data because the public key is what's gonna be shared with the world. Anyone can have your public key and they can encrypt data to you or for you with that public key. And because we need the key pair, which is the private key corresponding to that public key to decrypt, if you keep that secure and you're the only person who have it, which is the intention, then you are supposed to be the only person who can decrypt that message. It doesn't matter who encrypts a message to you. And so we're going to demonstrate that again. And so we had sender and receiver. Um, and so Again, if we go into our sender directory, um, I already have the sender build, but if you haven't got it built, just do go build and build sender. And we can take a look at that code also. And wasn't that interesting? Uh, you can see we have a parameter called K for key, and this is gonna be the public key by default. We read in a value and we now get that key, read it in as a public key, and then once we have the public key, then we're gonna read some text to encrypt. And then we use this encrypt PKCS1 version 15 or 1.5, and we encrypt it with a key, and that's our message, and then we write it out to standard out. Of course, this is gonna be some garbage, but that's okay. And so let's run our example. And so let me go back up a directory, and I'll do sender and sender and then if we do minus k for key because our keys or public key is in a different directory it's not in the current directory so we wouldn't be able to find it anyway and what we can do is run this and it's waiting for input so i can say hello this is a secure message and enter and then we do control d not c control d to say that so we want to end our input because here, IOUtil is gonna keep reading until end of file. And this is a standard input, which is where we're reading from the keyboard. So control D is basically telling IO reader, this is the end of input before it moves on to encrypt our data. And like I said, it writes it out, which you can see here. We encrypt it into this buffer, and then we write out the buffer to standard out. And this is where we see a bit of a garbage. That's okay, because if we rerun this and we rewrite it, to a text file, let's call it secret.txt or whatever you wanna call it, that bin is not really a text file, so we could call it any name we want, but that's what we've been using. And now I can say, hello, this is another SCCRATT secret message, uh, secure or secret, that's fine. 
message and then enter control D and now we don't have to worry about any crazy text on the command line or reader or receiver is going to use the private key to decrypt this rather secure message that we could imagine that was sent by some sender someone somewhere and so we can take a look at the receiver code and so that's main that go and so this too X reads in a private key and once it reads in the private key which we wrote out to the file if you remember key that private for example and we read in the key now this reads from standard input that cipher text that was generated so this just sits there and from standard in it reads in the encrypted text and then now it decrypts it into this buffer buff and then writes it out as a string to standard output. So I use fmt.println to do that. So let's see if my receiver is built and it's also built. And so I can say receiver and then call the receiver minus K and specify from the key gen directory key that private. This is the private key. And I want to give it the text I can use do like this means redirect or send to or program this secret.txt file. And then if I send this, now you can see we get our message. This you've seen before. So why did I show you again? I wanna show you what's the problem with doing um, the way we've been using it with asymmetric encryption. For very small messages, it works. But if we decide to grab a bit of text and maybe we decide to grab, I don't know how much or when exactly it's gonna fail, but let's try selecting that, say copy, and then I'll paste it here. And so I'll say, yes, okay, paste it. Remember my choices. Okay, so I paste that there, enter, and then I do control D. And now you can see what it says. Unable to encrypt message using crypto RSA, which is what we've been using to encrypt and decrypt message. It says the message is too long for RSA public key. So why might this be? Why would the library RSA prevent us from encrypting too long messages using asynchronous encryption, asymmetric keys. And for that, we need to sort of jump back and refresh our memory a little bit about the differences between asymmetric and symmetric encryption. So let's go back to the slides. So if you recall that when we do symmetric encryption, what we have is some text, which we're gonna be call our input, and we're gonna feed it to a cipher. And for that cipher, we need a key. And then of course we get ciphered output, which is all straightforward is exactly what we expect. That cipher output can then, and this is the sender, can then be fed into the similar cipher. And we build a simple cipher, if you remember, that simply did XOR. And that's basically the operation that a cipher does. I mean, of course, you come up with some more complicated bits that it's going to XOR to or input. But at the end of the day, it takes the key and somehow generates a set of bits um, bytes, sorry, that, well, that's bits too, but it generates a set of bytes that it needs to apply a, in an XOR operation to our input. And again, using the key, it generates a set of bytes and then it applies it to the encrypted text again, and now it gets back out that output. And that's why we said it all, this is symmetric encryption because both keys for encryption and decryption is the same. But notice, it's not clear here, but if you did the example that we did, when we wrote our simple cipher, the operation is very, very simple. And therefore it is not computationally intense and it wouldn't take a long time. So if you have a lot of text, you really wanna encrypt it or a lot of data, forget text. If you have a lot of data to encrypt, you really wanna do a symmetric cipher because the computation for doing that encryption is fairly cheap. On the other hand, if you're doing asymmetric encryption, we know that all we're gonna feed the cipher a text and a key, and of course we get cipher text out. The difference is when we go to decrypt, that cipher uses a different key, which is the pair to the encryption key, and we get our output. And this is why we say this is asymmetric key because the two keys are different, they're related, but different. So you have to imagine that on the encryption side, we have to do something extra such that the same key that was used for encryption cannot be used for decryption. We have to somehow prep the 
it, the, the cipher text when we're encrypting it so that or modify it in such a way that the same key cannot be used to decrypt it and only the key pair that is not just any other key that's different but it's only the key that is the pair to the key that we're using for encryption can be used to decrypt it and so that alone without knowing anything about the details about how they work that alone tell you that you must be doing some extra work somehow the values that you xr or whatever you do to them requires more work to ensure or to protect it against using the same key for decryption that was used for encryption and also making sure that the only key that can decrypt it is the key that um is the pair to the um, um the key that was used to encryption and so you must be somehow putting something in that cipher text that makes this possible and so that means that you're going to be doing a lot of work and so asymmetric encryption is computationally expensive and so therefore you will not want to use asymmetric encryption for things that as a, for a large body of input whether that's text or a file or whatever it is so if your data set is large you do not want to use asymmetric encryption and so the idea of block cipher is that they take text in chunks and they can encrypt it and the block ciphers are symmetric encryption um in symmetric ciphers and so that's fine because it's really really cheap okay so we have an idea of why we need to look at block cipher here we have some text and i, and I, I use text in these example only because that's what we type up and we see the immediate exam um the immediate effect of encrypting it that it doesn't look anything like what it's supposed to be and then we decrypt it and get back the exact same thing but remember this is just bytes to the computer so or bytes to the cipher so those that text or the bytes could represent actual text like image uh, file whatever you want video it doesn't matter it treats it the same way so if you want to encrypt a video file or a binary file or application all go through the same thing and the cipher does not care because that's just bytes at the end of the day but anyway let's stick with text and so i have some text that i want to put through a block cipher so remember with a um cipher uh symmetric cipher we're doing the xor operation and we did again just to remind you i keep repeating this we did a simple cipher so we need a stream or some place to get those bytes that we're going to use to do the xor operation with now, in our example, we simply use our key and apply it to the text and change it in some way. And then apply a key again to the change text, the cipher text, and come back and recover our input. But we need something more um, fancy than what we did. Right? Something more resilient, something that's not easily to break, that's as uh, easy to act. And so if you remember, one of the examples we did was if we guessed a key that is similar to the key we use, we kind of got back some of our text. We don't want that. So instead, this is stream represent the bytes that are going to be X or with our input. But the thing is, how do you get a stream? The stream is created from something called a cipher block. The cipher block is nothing more than this object that encapsulates or somehow implements a particular cipher um what should i say um a particular cipher there are many different types of cipher aes and all, all this other triple deci and all this other stuff and so the cipher block uses a key to implement how to produce that stream of bytes that we're going to use to the xr with and it's the stream that takes our text apply xr from the cipher block and creates our output now to make things easier so we don't have to call the stream directly because the stream only work on a slice of text at a time what we can do is use a stream writer a stream writer accept a stream right which is based off our cipher block and our cipher block has um uses our key so that uh, it can produce a stream based off of that key give bytes based off of that stream and the stream writer combines the stream of bytes for XR with our text to produce the encrypted or cipher text, right? Or the cipher data or cipher bytes, whatever you want to call it. Now, what exactly is a stream writer? A stream writer simply is an object that implements IO writer and it wraps a IO writer. 
And why does it wrap an IO writer? Is because then you can say, here's the stream I want to use, which is Cypher the stream, that pink thing at the top. So this is your S and some W, which is where do I write the output to? So when you say stream writer that write, because it implements IO writer, which you know, means that it has a write method. When you say IO um, stream writer that write, well, yes, I know where to get the stream of bytes to XOR, which is text that you give me, but where should I produce it? Now, we could simply have returned it as a buffer, but instead it takes an IO writer and it writes it out. Since it's a writer, it writes it out to whatever writer you initialize it with. So that's the encryption part of it. I hopefully this makes sense. And if this is, seems confusing, we'll take a look at the code just now. Now, like I said, for the stream writer, that S is your stream. And this W is simply where to write the um, cipher data to. On the other end, if you want to decrypt, because we have to decrypt the cipher text, we know that we will need a stream. Again, this is the place where we get those set of bytes that we're going to XOR with the cipher text in order to recover our output. And to create a stream, we need a cipher block. The cipher block is what implement the specific cipher algorithm. There are many of them, but whatever cipher algorithm that's going to be. And a cipher algorithm is going to use your key to determine which bytes it should produce into that stream so that the stream can XOR it with whatever, with whatever bytes you give it. To make things easy, we can use a, cipher, cipher, a stream directly, but we don't want to do that. Instead, we want to use a stream reader, just like how we use a stream writer, so that we can call it repeatedly, like how we can call anything that's a writer or a reader, we could call it repeatedly to read from it, or a writer we call it repeatedly to just write to it. Well, same thing. So the stream reader operates something like the stream writer, but it's in reserve, reverse. The stream reader needs to know the stream that it's where it's going to get those set of bytes to XOR according to the algorithm, the same cipher algorithm, and also need to know where it should get the cipher text. So that's going to be the input. And then of course it combines the two and it produces the result, which is going to be the decrypted um, bytes. And just like the stream reader, the stream writer is just simply this object that has a cipher stream, which is that S, and a reader, R, and this R represents where should it get the cipher input. And it just simply writes it out to some output. So we can see that since this is a reader, we can just use any of the ways of reading stuff from it that is available for that you normally do with an IO reader. Just like when we had an IO writer, the stream writer, we could just simply call the write method on it. For the reader, we'll just call the read method. Or if we want, we can use like IO.copy, for example. All right, so let's jump to the code and see how we can use a block cipher. So we're back on the command line. And so let's go back up a bit and out of this directory. And so we need to create a directory for part seven. So main key directory part seven, and we look in a block cipher. So let's go into seven. And what I want to do is start with a really simple example of how to create um, a block cipher. And then we'll work our way up. Let's start up our, start our Visual Studio Code Editor. So we do that. Um, I want to be a little bit lazy. So I'll go back to directory 6 and do go mod and copy it here. And that gives me that. And let's do um, example directory. So let's create example one. And in example one, like I say, I want to start off with a very simple example. So let's do main.go and of course package main and we'll do a function main. Okay. And the first thing I want to do is be able to get some input from the user. So I'm going to ask the user to enter some a message which we've seen before that we want to encrypt. So now we can imagine at line 12, once our code reached line 12, we already have some input from the user. Now we're doing symmetric, like I said, we're doing symmetric encryption. So we need a key. So this is going to be our simple key that we're going to use. 
I'm going to say that let's pass to some function we can call encrypt the message we get from the user and the key to use to encrypt it. And that function should return back a slice of bytes, which we're going to just say we're going to store in this buffer. And because we know that we, we print it out, it's going to look as crazy as what we had before. We've seen this before. What we'll do is we'll use X encode to encode that to a string. So that when we print it out, it looks somewhat sensible. We don't actually care what it is, but we just don't want our stream to look like it's just garbage on the screen. Then we're going to print a separation between our input and our output. And so that separation is this line, basically some dash, dash, dash. But then what we want to do now is imagine that we get some bytes, we wrote it to a file, we send it over the network, whatever you want to do, put it in an email, all this other stuff. And on the receiving end, we want to do decryption. So we're going to feed the bytes back to our decrypt function. And we have to give the same key, right? Because this is a, this is a symmetric encryption. So we have to use the same key. And then we're going to print out what our decrypt function returned. And that should be, since it's the set of bytes and we decrypted it, if we print out a string, it should be whatever we the user provided as input. So that's all our main met, um, function does. In terms of our receive function, well, that's pretty, in some of our encrypt functions, Ari, that's pretty straightforward. It's function encrypt, and we want to give it some text. We want to give it a key. And both of these things are byte slices. And we want to return a byte slice. So again, pretty straightforward. Now, when we provided our key here um, to our function, we need to create a block as we've seen before. But before we do that, let me just say that if we were able to say we have a bytes buffer, so I'm gonna create a bytes that buffer, right? If you haven't used bytes that buffer, basically, it is just a, an abstraction, a memory buffer in which you can read and write data into, and then you can ask for the byte. Pretty simple. So imagine that however I do my encryption, I am going to write the encrypted bytes to bytes that buffer, and this output bytes that buffer, and now I can return the bytes. So if you remember from the illustration that we did, what we really need to do is actually create a stream writer. And the stream writer is what's going to allow us to write this text to it. So let's do that. And so we can say C-I-P-H-E-R, cipher that stream writer. And the stream writer is just this object, right? It's a struct. See, stream writer wraps a stream into an IO writer. It calls X or stream key stream to process each slice of byte which passes through it and so all our writer is doing for us is wrapping up or make it look easy how you when you call write on this thing so for example if we have a cipher stream writer let's call it here writer is equals to we can do get a pointer to it because that's just easy to deal with and we do writer that write you know not close that write we could write the text that we're given right that's all there is to it so by simply saying write it at right we're gonna supply it with the text that we're given the plain text this write method because this writer the stream writer implements write it's gonna take each one of these bytes and XOR it with a byte that it gets it's gonna pass it essentially to the stream but how does it know which stream to use? Well, we have to provide it with the stream. Remember, there's a parameter called S for stream, and there was another parameter called W to say where it should write it out to. So that's going to be how our Cypher stream writer knows where to write the output, the Cypher output, that it's going to combine with the stream. And the stream, remember, is where it gets those bytes that needs to be XOR. So the stream is going to do the XRN. The stream writer is the one that's just coordinating the whole thing of taking this byte, giving it to the stream, and then taking the result and giving it to, writing it to our output, which is a IO writer. Now we need to be able to create um, our stream. So a stream 
is nothing more than Colin's cipher package that new OFB stream, for example. And in order for us to get, no, I don't want that. I want OFB, right? And in order to create a new OFB stream, and the thing with the OFB stream is that we can use it for encryption or decryption. So that's okay. So we don't have to specify that we want to create a new decryption stream or encryption stream. We just always create a OFB stream and then we could use it for either. And so we need to give it a block and we also need to give it this IV parameter. So just accept that we have to give it a block, B and this IV parameter. And that's pretty straightforward too. We can say IV, the simplest thing is to make a slice of bytes and how big should this, pro this thing be? Well, this should be the size of that's dictated by the encryption algorithm we're gonna use or the cipher algorithm we're gonna use. So we're gonna use AES and AES define a block size. And so we're gonna pass that to this new OBF to say, well, the block I want you to create, well, the block you're using has this block size. Now we haven't created the block yet. Well, that's really easy too. We can say AES that new and we can create a new cipher. It returns a block, an error. So we just go black error and we want to print out if we have an error. So we do FMT print line. Now here is the key that we need to use. Now, if we pass our key like this, no key is just a slice of byte either. But as you can see, it says it create and return a new cipher block. The key arrangement must be the AES key either 16, 24, or 32 bytes, right? So there's requirement of this length of this key. And so to ensure that all we have the correct length key, this key that we're passing in, this is probably is not 16 bytes, it's maybe more, maybe less. So one way to get around all of that is to simply say, let's use something like bcrypt. Now, this is package called bcrypt. And basically what it is, it's, a go package, but it's, you know, still being in the, I think this is like the experiment stage in place where they put things before they move it into the standard. And so bcrypt, we can use generate from password, which allows you to give it a set of bytes of basically any size and a cost value. And you can read what the cost value is, but basically what this does is it generates a password that is a fixed length, regardless of how many bytes you pass in here. And we can use that to know how we're gonna get a pretty decent password from the simple password that we pass in. So basically just experiment with this, call in bcrypt that generate password. And you'll see that even when you call this multiple times with the same password, you get something very different. So this is good for when you have to save user password in a database or something. So anyway, let's go ahead and let's copy this as the import. And so we'll paste it here. And then we'll say that we want to generate a password. So we're going to say this is our shared password. And so pretty straightforward. All I'm doing is say shared password is bcrypt that, bcrypt that generate from password, the password that was passed in, and I'm saying use the default cost. It, the costs have to do with how difficult the password is to generate and allows you to, in the future, if you have more computing power available to you, to say it all, oh, password needs to be updated because they're too weak or something like that. So um, just definitely read it. But if we now read, we develop this code sort of from bottom up, but if we start reading it forward, we'll see what's going on. We take key that was given, we generate a password that's a bit more complicated and longer than what might have been given to us. And now that we have the, um, that we we'll call that shared key, now we can take that and pass it to our AES new cipher to create a new cipher. But if you remember that new cipher expect our password length to be, you know, 16, 24 or 32. Now here we're printing out the length of our password, um, of our shared password that we've generated. Now, if you run this, you'll see it all 
bcrypt generate password that are 60 bytes remember that's too much that's more than what we need so instead we will say that our shared password shared key is actually equals to let's just sort of truncate it to 32 bytes because it's either 16 24 or 32 so let's just use the max which is 32. um shared key by the way this is the shared key we have to pass here and now we can pass this to cipher to create a new block we take our block and we create a new stream and then using the stream we create a stream writer and then we write our cipher, um, plain text to it we have cipher text in the output and we return that now we can then now work on creating our decrypt function decrypt function pretty much looks like our encrypt function of course it's going to be called decrypt but it's the same thing it takes not text but really um this is the ciphered input um that we got so we can just call this the buffer of bytes and again i'm going to say that oh if i have a bytes that buffer like this i'm going to somehow have the text that we want to return in there and so the plain text and so what I want to do is just return all that bytes, right? And just as before, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of work our way backwards. Well, actually, let's work our way forward because now that we know it all we want, we encrypted the data. We know it all we need to decrypt it. And in order to decrypt it, we need to use the same key. So we're going to start with that. We're going to say that, oh, let's create a key. And so we take the key, remember it's the same key that's given for encryption, same key is given to decryption, or we pass it to bcrypt. Now, you might be thinking, ha, huh, Veral, you said that our bcrypt is gonna take the same value and generate a different key. Exactly. And so we're gonna have a different key here. So, but let's continue anyway. So now that I have a key, now I know that I need to create what? A new cipher. So I'm going to say that the cipher we wanna create is a AES cipher and so AES cipher new key well actually I don't need to do this here now I can do that and with our block we can now go ahead and create a stream and the stream is very simple the stream simply says use this this block and this block size and we use a byte of that block size it's empty we don't need to initialize it to anything you could if you want to but I'm gonna go the easy way now the other thing we need is a stream reader and like I said with the stream reader what we have is this struct object that says this is the stream I want to use to where I should get those bytes and if you remember for encryption we did the exact same thing we just need a stream which we created from a block and now we're going to apply that to the cipher bytes which is where we're going to read from. And so the striper stream in really is nothing more than creating in and it's from our buffer. Buffer represents our cipher text in bytes. We put a reader around it so we can give it to the stream reader. Now we have a read um, a reader. If I try to read from it, well, that's just going to say, oh, I need to provide some data. Now, how do you read from a reader? Well, you have reader that read and you usually give it a slice. Based on how big the slice is, the reader knows how many bytes it should put in that slice. So a reader will now try to get from input enough bytes based on the destination it needs to write it to. And then, of course, it adds the detail of pulling bytes from the stream, XORing it with our input ciphertext to create now the plain text output. But that's one way in which we can read from it. We will now have to determine how big a slice we need to create in order to read all the data. And it's because of that, I don't want to worry about how big a buffer I need to provide to reader. Instead, I am going to create a buffer. Remember, you can read and write for a buffer. And I'm going to simply use IO that copy. And so I simply say copy data from here to there. And that gives me all the cipher, the decrypted text. Now that I have the decrypted text and I return it from decrypt, I can then um, print it out as a string. So let's run this and see if it works. So let's go to example one directory. We could go build 
actually we can just do bool run so we don't have any binaries to deal with and enter some text and we can say hello this is a test and we enter like this we do control d and voila it doesn't work well we kind of suspected and i hinted as much but look at these bytes start off looking the same 97 36 49 48 36 57 and then notice what happened here this is 116 and then 84 and then 76 so it's different so even though we pass the same key to bcrypt it created something very different what we need our decrypt um, function to do is to use the exact same key that we encrypt with so let's fix that by now we have the foundation let's fix that now in our second example so we do example two and now we're going to make it so that let's close this to make sure that we're working with the right code and we're going to fix it so that we're using we really use in the same key. So what we can do is pull out the share key generation out here into main. We know that we need it to be 32 bytes in length. So we do something like that. We slice it again, then we could print it out to verify that it was just 32 bytes. And then now what we will, will do is pass to or encrypt and decrypt the shared key. But this now represents really does represent the exact same key and then of course here we're just simply using key so decrypt and here we don't actually need to generate um call bcrypt ourselves because we actually want to use the key that was passed in and not um generate our own key so this simplifies things a little bit because we only created the key once and so this now much simpler and super quick example we should now be able to do go run and now if we run our example and say hello this is a test and we enter it and we control d notice how this actually works but more than that if we actually copy back this text that actually failed but let's rerun our example and now we'll paste this now and if you remember this failed before now it doesn't fail it encrypts it and it decrypts all of it we don't have a problem of you know too long but there's a problem though in order for this to work if we imagine that this is this line represent the sender and then the receiver notice how they have to have the same key and we have to provide that key somehow and this could work if you generated the key and then you, you and your buddy are together and then you agree on what the key is but remember, it can't be the text key because if you call bcrypt with it, it's going to generate something else. It has to be the output of after you generate a long enough key. Now, you could agree on a key that is 32 bytes long or 16 or whatever. You could do that and then it, you don't need to use bcrypt. But that's the important thing. It must be the exact same key, which means that the sender and receiver must previously agree on the key. And so there seems to be a problem with that if you want to send somebody something and you didn't force agree on a key like i couldn't send you something if we weren't in the same place to agree on a key because if i tried to call you and tell you the key maybe somebody else is listening on that phone call so how can we get around this so one thing we can do is actually send the key to the receiver so that they can decrypt it so let's go and try that example so let's close this up let's copy it and let's paste this back what we call this example three and so we'll close this and so what we can do now is we can say well why don't we create a type called a payload right you can call it whatever you want but i just call it payload and what payload is a struct and it has the message we want to send which we're going to encrypt and then the key that we want to that we use to encrypt that message if we can do this then if we send the key to the user um, who is supposed to receive it, then we don't have to worry. They will have the key that we want them to use to decrypt the message. And that's pretty straightforward to do because what we, all we have to do is create this new structure called a payload and populate it. And so let's just say that for the encryption side of thing, let's go to the encryption side of thing. We're gonna encrypt with this key. So. We're going to do the work here 
and have moved this from here back into encrypt because encrypt is going to be the one that's going to encrypt the message. So the key that encrypt used to encrypt the message it should be the same key that it should provide to the receiver to say, hey, I want you to be able to decrypt. Um, actually, um, this is going to be outside. So let's do this. So we want to provide the key here. Well, actually, we want to provide the key here alone to encrypt. Decrypt will not get the key from, uh, you're not going to provide decrypt with a key, but rather the key is going to come in the message itself. Um, and that's because our message really going to be this payload. So we'll, we'll get there and we'll see how this works. So decrypt is not going to get the key from here, but we'll come back and work on decrypt in a bit. Let's close it up. So encrypt takes the key, generates the shared key, which is 32 bytes. And then this is the shared key. And then it creates a block and everything just as before. But what we're going to do is now that we have our ciphertext in out, instead of returning the ciphertext, what we're going to do is create a payload. And the payload object is the object that we just defined the structure for. We're going to say a payload represents the message, which is this out that bytes, which is our ciphertext. And the key to decrypt or encrypt this message, this is the key, right? So we'll just simply add that to um, say that's the shared key. Okay. Um, now that we have the shared key, now we can use something like gob to encode this go object as a set of bytes. Now, because we only use in go as our programming language, we can totally use gob. So let's create a new bytes that buffer. Just then we just call it bytes that buffer to create a new buffer actually. And then we're going to say, what I want to do is create a new encoder which is gob encoder, that new encoder. And the encoder, since we have to write to it, well, that's going to be our buffer, bytes that buffer. Remember, I keep saying it all with a buffer. In memory buffer, you can read and write to it. So now I say encoder, I want you to encode, and I want you to include this payload, which is this value. And then now that we have this encoded, now we just need to say b that out because b represents the bytes for this payload, which if you remember, are these two things. It's the message and the key. So once we have that and we return it, now we can go to our decrypt function. And before we can do any decryption, we need to figure out what the key is. Well, figuring out the key again is fairly easy. What we can do is we can start with some bytes that buffer, and we can say a new reader because if we create a new reader from this buffer that was provided to us, now we can say that our oh, what we need is to decrypt it using gob that new decoder and giving this decoder a reader where to read bytes from, which would be B. And what do we, is it that we want to decrypt? Well, we want to decrypt a payload. We can say decode that you know, decode it into payload, this variable. And so decode returns if there is an error. And so we can now check and see or print out if there was an error decoding this for whatever reason. If we don't have any problem decoding this, well then we have a shared key. Our shared key is simply from our payload, that encryption key. That is our shared key because it was sent to us. And now we can actually print that out. Now that we have the shared key, we can use that shared key to create our block and the same thing as before, create our um, stream then use the stream to read from. But now where do we create our new reader from? Now with buffer, because buffer represents the entire payload, but rather we want to use payload that message. This is the thing that is our ciphertext. And then once we Put, create a new reader with that, we pass that to the stream reader, and now we can read it out and copy it to out just as before. So the only work really was in this first part here. So let's see why is this complaining? Um, buff, oh, I removed too many things. So this is a byte slice. 
so it needs a type. And so now we should have, again, another working example where, notice the, the interesting thing here, only the encryption part knew what key was used. So you can imagine that this encryption part, even though in my example, I supplied it with a key, I really could just remove a key and just say encrypt a message. And within this encrypt function, I could just generate a random key so long as I have the key side as needed to create that block. So here I don't show it, but you can imagine just generate 32 bytes of random number and use this as the key. And because we're sending it to in our, our message, the other side is going to be able to decrypt it, which is what I have to prove to you still. So let's clean up our screen a little bit and let's go to example three and then I'll do go run. And then here's our message. So we could say, hello, this is a test message with key included or something, right? And then control D and we should be, oh, well, oh, invalid key side is 15. Huh, why this is supposed to be 32 and it is 32. Um, decrypt message area, invalid key. Hmm, invalid memory address. So what happened? Let's go back and see. Um, so, oh, um, let's see, so generate our keys, 22, that's fine. Um, yep, this is a byte slice, this is a byte slice. Yeah, uh, a byte slice here. So this assigns it, we should be able to, oh, actually, let's double check, on the decrypt side, we should be hello new cipher um oh we didn't even get to creating um the key so error aes invalid key size 15. okay so this is on the encrypt side of things um oh here we go this is a key this key size is yeah i need to update this to say shared key <laughs> so that's the problem i need to say shared key is what we use here not the key, because we're using the key to generate our longer key, but yes, this is the error. So that makes sense. So let's rerun it again. Say, hello, this is a test message. And it's just a bug in the code. And then there we go. And notice how we're able to decrypt the message because we send the same key. And so we parse it and we get back the, the key that was sent. No. This sort of defeats the whole purpose because if someone was able to intercept our message here, they would have this payload which represents the encrypted message, but then the key itself. Now, even if they don't understand the key because the key looks like just these crazy bytes here, it still doesn't matter. Once they know that oh, we're sending the message and the key to decrypt the message, well, then they can just do the exact same thing that we're doing. But we're sort of on our way because what we can do then is encrypt the key now. Now, this seems like a little far-fetched, but let's go back to our slides. If you remember that we have this payload and inside of a payload, we have the shared key and the message. Well, we know the message is already ciphered using a block cipher, which is just using symmetric keys. And before we were storing our keys just like that. It wasn't encrypted in any way. But if we can use asymmetric encryption, we can asymmetrically encrypt our key and we can use the public key to encrypt our shared key. And that tells us that the only person that can decrypt this key that's supposed to decrypt the message is the intended recipient. Does that make sense? So because our key is not long, it's okay for us to spend some time encrypting it, but our message could be very long, so there we use a block cipher. So now our message is encrypted and our key is also encrypted. The difference is that the key to decrypt the message is using asymmetric encryption, which means only the intended recipient can decrypt it. And then only because they can decrypt the key that's used to decrypt the message, only they can decrypt the message. So now let's get back to the code. And so if we now copy this, paste it, and we call this example four, and let's just close this to make sure that we're working with the right example. We go here. Now, all we really need to do is introduce encryption. So let's just close our decrypt function here and work on 
encryption for us. The only thing we really need to do is before we store our key, put it inside the message, the only thing we have to do is encrypt our, um, our shared key. And for that, as we said, we're going to use asymmetric encryption. And so what we can do then is, first of all, we have to provide to our um, encrypt function. And like I said, for all we care, we don't need to give our encrypt function the key to encrypt because this could be a random key. What we really need to give it is, in this case, is the public key. So, because once we're sending a message, we want to encrypt this key with um, the receiver's public key. And this is still going to be a slice of bytes. Once we have that, well, encrypting our key is fairly easy. It's just saying RSA that encrypt using this guy. We need a random number generator. We need the public key, which we have here as the receiver's public key. Right? And in this case, the message is really the shared key. That is the thing that we want to do asymmetric encryption with. This function returns a byte, which is the ciphertext, and an error. So we have um, as a return value the shared key and some error. So we, I mean, we overwrite in our shared key, but that's okay. So we can put that in our payload. And of course, we can print out and see if we have any error. So that's basically it. So let's see what kind of error we get. Oh, we need the random number generator. And we've done this in the past, created random number generator. And basically what we want is, uh, let's go here. We want to be able to say that, oh, we have some key size that we're going to work with. So I'm going to say key size. Um, before we've used 1024, but I'm going to say, okay, 2048 is a good key size. And let's create a variable here, a global variable. And we can say ran that um, reader. And this is where we get our random number source for our random number. And so that's there. Um, for our encrypt function, we don't need to provide the key, but rather the receiver, um, that public key. That's what we need to provide. And um, if you remember, the way we create a public key is to say RSA that generate key and we give it a random number generator and we say give it the key size, the number of bits. And this function returns a pointer to a private key, which is going to be the receiver's key and some error message. Now, I don't expect us to have an error in creating the key, so I'm going to ignore that for now. And so here we go. And once you have a public key, it's also have a, once you have a private key, it's also have a public key part. So this is, takes a pointer. So we're just saying that all we pass in the pointer of who we expect to receive this key. That's what we're basically saying is the receiver of this message. We're going to use their public key to encrypt the message. Well, we know it's always not really encrypting the message, but rather encrypting the key that we're going to send to them. And so everything else remains the same here. We, okay, no, uh, what's it complaining about now? No new variable on the left hand side. Okay. Um, no new variable. Yeah, there we go. Um, no new variable because we have error and shared key already. So that's fine. And so we encrypt it, put it in our payload. So that takes care of that on the encryption side. So now we don't have to worry because now we know that our, our key is safe. It's encrypted and only the intended receiver should be able to decrypt it. Now, if we go to the decrypt function, well, in order for our message to be decrypted, well, we need the private key. So we should provide that here, RCV, receiver key. Um, and the receiver, given the private key, well, we have to say here that the receiver key is going to be the private key, which is RSA, that private key. So there we go. And 
the only thing that is different, we still decrypt, decode, Gabin decode our message to get the payload. We get the key, but before we can say that, oh, this is the key that we actually want to use, what we have to do is say that, oh, we need to decrypt it. And so for that, um, let's just do RSA that decrypt, and we decrypt with this random number generator. We give it the receiver private key, which is RECV, and we give it the cipher text. The cipher text is the payload that encryption key, which has been encrypted by our sending function. And of course, this returns the decrypted key and an error message. And so let's do that. Now, shared key is a new variable, so that's fine. Let's save this. And what is this complaint about again? Um, it's a key. Oh. And to, to, to undefined, oh, receive a key. And then now we should print out if we have an error message. And assuming that we don't have an error, we should be able to get back our 32 bytes long key. And then we just use it the same way as before. So that's the only thing we had to do was decrypt it first. And so let's go to example four directory and we do go run and then we have to enter some text and so here again you see it works the only difference is now you know that our, our message here that includes the key to decrypt the message is secure and only the person who can decrypt it can do it and we can easily test this we can say let's generate a not a key let's call it attacker key for example and this is the attacker and let's imagine that the attacker is trying to decrypt our message and so the attacker we will put another separation here and the attacker is going to try and decrypt our message but instead of using the receiver private key because the attacker doesn't have the receiver's private key the attacker tried to use their own private key to decrypt the exact same message. And we should see that it's going to fail, All right? So let's put that there. And if we do go run and put that there, All right? And we do control D and you can see that our receiver was able to receive the message. But when our attacker tried to decrypt the message, they were not able to recover our shared key and therefore since they couldn't get the shared key they could not create a cipher which means they could not decrypt the message so there you go we have found a way to send a message with a shared key without previously sharing the key now when you look at this example i have a fifth example which i'm not going to go over in this video because this video is already very long but that shows you how to do signature so now not only can you say that oh well not only can you decrypt the message but you can also say oh i know who sent this message and i can verify the signature so that's a little bit more involved but you should be able to understand it but it builds on exactly what we have done here using the same idea of sending the message sending the key but now, of course, all we have to do is send an encrypted digest of the message. And the receiver now is going to be able to decrypt that digest, well, recompute it, decrypt it, and then um, verify that, oh, oh, this digest represents um, the same message I was sent. So I know the message wasn't tampered with, and I know who sent it. Okay, so pretty involved. Let me know if you have questions. Um, this is really involved, and it's getting kind of heavy but hopefully you're able to see um, how clever this is, being able to send a message, send the key to decrypt that message. But because we combine both symmetric and asymmetric encryption in the same example, we're able to now just have public keys from anyone and be able to send them a message securely that they can decrypt any size messages because we're using a much simpler um, asymmetric encryption and you can play around I encourage you to play around with just having your encryption function 
just generates a random number of bytes. So forget bcrypt, just generate 32 random bytes. Just sit in the loop, generate 32 random bytes, and you'll see this works exactly the same. All right, take care. See you in the next video. Bye.